<laughs> yeah, apparently, huh? <laughs> song and dance uh, Mark went to San Francisco State and um, did his, wait, you went to UC Santa Cruz. For my undergrad. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, he John Pierce. He was a banana slug way back when. Yeah. Um, but then he went to San Francisco State, but actually Moss Landing, which yeah. I noticed on the website doesn't say Moss Landing, so you can uh -huh. see that. And then he did, did a PhD at UC Santa Barbara. And then, right. so when he was here, um, he worked with Greg Kai, and he worked in a different era of diving. And the title of his thesis is Spatial and Temporal Patterns and Re of Recruitment and Young of the Year Rockfish into a Central California Kelp Forest. And he went on to publish that and has, same question. I know. welcome, um, has continued to work, and from his website and his description on his own um, uh, research interests are looking into the conceptual understanding of marine populations and communities by conducting empirical studies motivated by the evolving theory for these systems, and mostly in kelp forests, and then also um, how to apply these concepts to fisheries and conservation problems in innovative ways. And so he teaches kelp forest ecology and marine ecology up at UC Santa Cruz. And he's gonna be talking today about the uh, causes and consequences of geographic patterns in kelp forest communities, but he's been an advocate for I'm setting up large scale experiments and small scale experiments. And one of the, why I brought his thesis here is because he actually made his own kelp bed and looked at, so, did some of the seminal work on recruitment of rockfishes into kelp beds. And he did that by making an experiment fill kelp bed on its own. That also was an era where you did not need a dive buddy. In fact, you didn't even need a dive buddy. They just had to be in the same bed. Right. So he and Dan Reed, I always talk about how they would just launch a boat, drop one off at one site and one off at the other site, and you just get your work yourself. done. And so, and you can get a thesis out of that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> That's true. Thank you. Um, I bring Dan, uh, Mark up because I was at a meeting for because I span diving and diving safety and also uh, diving techniques and also research and. I was with some people from Florida, and they dive over coral reefs, and they teach their students perfect buoyancy. In fact, you should not even touch the bottom. You should float around like a little mermaid up off the bottom with your feet in the air. And <clears throat> they tested us to see if we could do it in this one time, and I, I brought up Mark Carr. I said, well, in the kelp beds in California, you have to be on the bottom. In fact, this one researcher from UC Santa Cruz, he will just take his fins off and just trudge along the bottom, pulling himself along by the stipes of the understory. And uh, it's just different strokes. <laughs> Kelp <Right. laughs> um, Dire right. disturbance. Right. Um, but no he offense. is going to, I'm supposed to introduce something that he'll bring up at the end of his talk, which is about his goat. Mary Margaret, his wife, who is also uh, acknowledged in his uh, master's thesis, uh, works here at Moss Landing. And uh, they have a farm out in um, Watsonville. And he, this was, I'm supposed to bring up his goats, which They're I think he's gonna touch on. My talented end. goats, he just at the end. He is not going to talk about the large scale experiments that he is trying during this year of many storms yep. that was developed the ideas of caging yeah. out in the kelp beds. But we would love to talk, hear about that at Some happy day. hour afterwards. Cool. Without further ado, Mark Carr, thank you for coming. You bet. Thanks, Di. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, can you guys hear me okay? I, I don't think I need this. Just yell. Let me know if there's a problem. And I got my little gizmo going for the recording, just so we're good. Um, so over the next 45, 15 minutes, I want to try and do two things. I want to try to share um, some of the insights that we're generating about what processes uh, structure uh, kelp forest communities up and down the coast of California. And then the second major goal is not to embarrass Mary Margaret um, too much. And, but the, of course the problem is that you, the, this is more difficult than, uh, than sharing insights uh, with you guys. So, so, right? Sorry about that, okay? <laughs> Sorry, sweetheart, but that's uh, how it happens. Um, so 
So I want to start uh, by making the point that one of the uh, most obvious and yet in fact fascinating observations in nature are uh, the persistent differences in the structure of communities. By that I mean the species that occur there and their relative abundances um, from one place to another. Um, and in fact, there's many of you in the room that I could drop you in a kelp bed blindfolded at Terrace Point or Hopkins or Stillwater, and within 10 minutes, many of you could tell me where you are, you know, which of those kelp forests you're in. And it's because there are these long, persistent differences in the species that constitute those ecosystems. Um, and that becomes a really valuable tool for ecologists because the comparison in space of those different communities and differences in the environmental variables associated with that is what we do oftentimes to understand what drives and creates differences in the structure of communities. Not just the taxonomic structure like biodiversity, but also uh, functional relationships among species that underpin the productivity of a system. So that has set off a, a number of different questions that ecologists ask about communities. <clears throat> and, and so one of those is how do these communities vary in space and why do we see the variation that we see? What are the ecological and the environmental processes that can explain those spatial patterns that we see? Um, and are these patterns and the environmental correlates consistent among assemblages that constitute the communities? And by that, the assemblages I'm referring to are the fishes, the invertebrates, the algae. And oftentimes, what you see in the literature are these kinds of characterizations, but just for one of those assemblages, often coral reef fishes, let's say. And in fact, they call them fish communities. But in fact, they're not, right? It's the fish, the invertebrates, and the algae that in combination constitute a community. And so one of the questions that, that, he, that I'm interested in is just how coherent are the patterns of these different assemblages so that when we see spatial and explain spatial variation in one, how well does that reflect the causes of spatial variation in the other parts of these communities? Um, and then another question that ecologists are, are asking now, are patterns of taxonomic and functional structure and diversity spatially concordant? Um, and that's because when we look at taxonomic patterns of community structure, we're oftentimes interested in, say, biodiversity, the number of species that are supported by a, a community. But also, we're making inferences about functional processes, right? By, by relating taxa to their functional roles. <clears throat> and um, oftentimes, uh, ecologists are describing taxonomic patterns or functional patterns. And the question is, how well do those correspond with one another? How well can you use taxonomic patterns of community structure to make inferences about functional structure of these communities? And then finally, what are the consequences of these patterns and the sources of variation of community functions? So the system that I address these questions in, as you can imagine, are kelp forests um, along the coast of California. And like many of us in this room, uh, we've, we've, been, uh, we've gravitated to kelp forests to, do commun to study community ecology for several reasons. One is because of the amazing productivity of these systems. So down here at the bottom of this table is macrocystis. And I've highlighted the net primary production of macrocystis relative to all of these terrestrial forests. Let me try this guy. Which one of these little devils? Right there. These are all terrestrial forests, including tropical rainforests. And you can see the productivity of macrocystis easily matches that of the most productive terrestrial forests, um, along with several other uh, uh, macroalgae as well. Um, but notice that even though there's this tremendous productivity, it doesn't stay around long compared to all the, the standing crop of terrestrial forests. And there's two reasons for that. One is it gets consumed very quickly. It's not protected the way a lot of terrestrial uh, 
material, plant material is. And secondly, it gets exported. It gets removed rather quickly. And when it does that, it goes to other ecosystems, including getting thrown up on sandy beaches um, or being transported offshore uh, to deep canyon habit ecosystems, where it, it plays a, a really important functional role as, as a, in subsidizing these other ecosystems, right? This is a classic example of ecosystem connectivity and the subsidies of one ecosystem that contribute to the maintenance and the productivity of other ecosystems. And kelp forests uh, are huge that way. But for the algae, for the material that remains in the forest, it supports an amazing diversity of species. Um, and an example from, uh, I think this is Wheeler North's classic work in the 70s. In one Southern California kelp forest alone, he counted 130 species of algae eight, and 800 species of invertebrates and fishes, right? Which clearly rivals any kind of terrestrial forest. Um, and as such, again, explaining what maintains and creates that biodiversity in these systems has been a big attraction. So what I want to do is introduce you to the, to the forest, the players in the system. I'm going to try to do that by introducing you both to the taxonomic diversity as well as the functional diversity in the system simultaneously. And we're going to do this really fast. I'm sorry, but we've got to blast through this because I want to dwell more on the results. But what I've listed in the black uh, font here are several of the functional traits um, that ecologists usually often use to characterize functional roles in a community. Um, and I'm going to start <coughs> with thermal affinity, which oftentimes influences where species occur um, along the coast, and then growth form of algae, which has all sorts of implications for the other species in the system. And each of those are different categories of different functional uh, roles of those species. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to start with a quick description of how I characterize thermal affinity. Um, and that was largely by describing where these species ranges for each of the taxa that I'll be describing occur up and down the coast. And you can see that there's six, actually uh, one, two, three, four, five <coughs> spatial categories plus a cosmopolitan category. Um, so I try to categorize every taxon into these different thermal affinities. And I'm telling you now that the best way to do that is to ask somebody who knows what the hell they're talking about, right? If you go to the books, to the literature, you get, I think, biased estimates just based on some Yahoo seeing macrocystis in Botswana once. And all of a sudden, that defines the range of the species. So you got to go to people who know the actual distribution of these different species, where, where the individuals occur. So for algae, there's this guy that you might know. Um, for fishes, several fish heads, and then the invertebrates are Steve Lonhart, who's with the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So I got input from those guys for these distributions, as well as this thermal gradient that Scott's very familiar with, um, along the Santa Barbara Channel Islands, right? And the red temperatures are warmer water, the blue temperatures are colder water. We'll talk about that and how it influences these spatial patterns of, of community structure as well. So let's go through quickly. Um, the autotrophs include uh, uh, categories of surface canopy forming species, sub canopy forming species, understory species, and then turf or encrusting low growing algae. So there's those four categories, functional categories. And for each of those, as I mentioned, they can be further classified by those thermal. So you got macrocystis, which falls largely in the warm temperate, nereocystis that falls in the cold temperate. If you turn to the subcanopy forming species, there's again a whole slug of species that are within that warm temperate and others, different species, that occur in the cold temperate categorization. Thank you, Michael. <coughs> um, then there's uh, further understory species uh, that uh, again fall out in these diff different thermal affinities. Um, and, then, uh, and then others, many of which, uh, like the corallins, um, uh, encrusting or articulate, as well as the red algae, are pretty much cosmopolitan. They tend to occur uh, up and down the coast, especially the categories that we use to characterize the red foliose algae. 
which are described by their morphology. So you see the red algae um, are described as branching, lacy, bushy, leaf-like. I'm a fish guy, okay, and that works for me. But, but it actually is meaningful because um, I had a student, Katie Kunkel, um, who looked at the invertebrate assemblages associated with these different kinds of algal morphologies. And she found really marked differences in the assemblage of the invertebrates that associated with the different forms of the algae. Right? And this wasn't driven by just a couple of species. You see right here this breakdown that no species contributed to more than 10% of that variation among those. So, so the, the for differences in form of the understory algae have a big influence on the kinds of invertebrates that, that live uh, on those algae. Um, so it's a nice way to categorize them. Then when we turn to animals, the invertebrates and the fish, they're often characterized by their trophic level or their trophic uh, type, whether they're, for example, detritivores or herbivores or planktivores, and their feeding mode, um, like deposit feeders or filter feeders. And so in combination, that describes what they feed on as well as how they feed on things, which are functionally distinct among different species. Um, so here's some examples. Here's the detritivores, right? And there's 13 different taxa. Um, and again, they occur associated with these different thermal affinities up and down the coast. Um, the herbivores, likewise. And now the herbivores um, <coughs> can either be strict herbivores that are either discriminate predators feeding on particular things, or, uh, um, or yep, as fish or invertebrates, or non-discriminate feeders that just cruise along the bottom feeding on things. Those herbivores can also feed on detritus, so they're combined, um, or they can also feed on microinvertiv uh, be microinvertivores, feeding on little microinvertebrates. So they're combinations, they don't just do one thing. Similarly, the planktivores um, can either be strict as discriminate or non-discriminate. Those are largely fishes. Um, uh, or they can also feed on microinvertebrates or fishes. Um, or detritus, right? Again, as active or passive. So all of these traits characterize how and what they feed on in the system. These are the microinvertivores that I was talking about, things that eat little, uh, little invertebrates, either strictly or along with large macroinvertebrates or, herbiv or be herbivores or planktivores or scavengers, right? So it's all these different combinations. Mike, I, and I, Mike Graham and I grappled with this decades ago, um, trying to characterize all, all these different functional roles. And then there's the macroinvertivores um, that feed on those uh, strictly, um, or, and you can see again, it's a mix of fish species and invertebrates, or they also will feed on the microinvertebrates, or, or fishes, or uh, scavenge on dead things as well. So again, uh, categories of feeding. And then the piscivores that feed on fish strictly or along with other macroinvertebrates or microinvertebrates, um, or they switch between being a planktivore and a piscivore. So these, again, are categories. Um, <clears throat> and what the, all those combinations of how and what they feed on are ways of characterizing the functional groups that constitute a, a community, right? And we're interested in understanding not just how the species taxonomically vary, um, but also how these functional um, roles vary. So the question that I first posed was, how do communities vary in space? And are the patterns of variation consistent among the fish, the invertebrates, and the algae that constitute the communities? And, uh, and the, way, the reason I can ask this question is this unique opportunity that we had when we were doing baseline characterizations of kelp forest communities at the onset of creating the marine protected areas up and down the coast of California. So with my colleague Jen Cassell down at UC Santa Barbara, who uh, did, conducted the surveys that Scott was also uh, involved in, uh, along the southern coast mainland and the Channel Islands. Then our lab did central California and then up here in the north central California region. Okay? And altogether, 
that gave us 172 places, excuse me, 170 places that we sampled for two years in a row to try to characterize the structure of these communities. Um, and we did it, as I said, largely in association with the location of these marine protected areas. But you'll notice that there's a lot of MPAs and there's some pretty serious gaps, spatial gaps. And that's, uh, you'll notice, you uh, uh, marine mammal nuts will recognize that those are associated with haulouts like Piedras Blancas, Año Nuevo, oops, um, Piedras, Año Nuevo, uh, up here at Point Reyes. And the problem with those things is that they attract these things. And then I can't get people to go in and count the fish and characterize the communities, right? So that's the explanation for some of the, the gaps in this otherwise pretty amazing geographic uh, opportunity. Um, and then what we do, and I'm going to explain this very quickly, what we do at each of these places is we drop into the kelp forest. We're looking down onto the kelp bed um, to characterize the invertebrates and the algae. There's a total of six of these 30 meter long transects that are distributed from the inshore to the outshore, offshore edge of the kelp beds across the depth range, because we're trying to characterize the benthic community in that whole forest. So we want to representatively sample it. We do the same thing for the fishes. We do 12 of these transects at four different depths. And then in combination, right, we're characterizing the uh, benthic and the fish communities within a given kelp bed. What the hell was that? Was that an earthquake or something? Oh, sweet. Um, <coughs> um, so, so, uh, so again, uh, just to emphasize that we're going across that depth gradient to, to representatively sample that with the benthic as well as the fish surveys. Um, and in the fish surveys, we're, we're counting all the fish on these vol in these volumes of, of water or transects that we swim. And then likewise, on the bottom, we're doing 2 meter by 30 meter wide swaths, doing point intercept percent cover estimates, as well as recording the density, the number of individuals per unit area along these transects, as well as habitat features. OK, so you do all that monkey business. And <clears throat> you generate characterizations of the community at each one of those sites. This is referred to as a non-metric, multi-dimensional scaling plot, right? And all you need to know about these things is that the closer that two points are to one another, the more similar the communities are, or the assemblages are, um, of the, for those two sites. The more distant um, two sites are, then the more different their assemblage or communities are. So this is a plot for the fish assemblages based on their taxonomic structure, right? So this is we're 152 different fish taxa across the study, and we're plotting the similarity of the fish assemblage, the relative abundance of those fishes at every one of those sites. And I've color-coded them because they actually form distinct clusters um, that, are, um, that are distributed up and down the coast um, in distinct ways. So this, if you're, a, if you're into this kind of thing, uh, the, this is the centroid distance based on um, the, the scaling and, and the Bray uh, Curtis dissimilarity index. Um, and these are the different clusters that come out. And, um, and, there's, uh, and you can see there's seven of these clusters. And I've color coded each of these clusters, these distinct <coughs> assemblages, and <clears throat> to show you where they're distributed along the coast. So what you, and so here's the coast of California, north central, central, and southern California. And what you see right off the bat is that site, sites, fish assemblages, are very similar among sites on the north central coast and very different from those in central California, which are similar to one another, and different to Southern California, which are relatively similar to one another. You see that they're more similar to one another on the mainland than they are out on the islands. And you tend to see this, uh, this um, gradient in the fish assemblage uh, structure as you go from the east to the west along that chain of islands, right? So that's the, that shows you 
how those fish assemblages are distributed in, in geographic space. Now we're going to shift to the invertebrates. And again, we show the clustering of these guys and how those uh, clusters are distributed geographically. And for the most part, you see, again, that same pattern. You see that the invertebrates at these sites up on the north central coast tend to be more similar to one another than any of the sites in the central coast or the south coast and vice versa. This time you tend to see a little more mixing between the islands and the mainland um, down in southern California um, and actually distinct invertebrate assemblages that are different from uh, the central coast um, <clears throat> and, and the south coast. Whereas, let me back up for just a second. Whereas uh, down here, you see out on San Miguel Island, the assemblages are more similar to what you saw in Central California. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and then the algal assemblages that cluster out. And again, a pretty similar pattern, but not quite the same. So, and, and more mess with the algae than the others. You tend to see uh, some, some sites that share assemblages between regions. Um, this is a different blue than these up here, but you do see mixes, especially here on the Monterey Peninsula. Um, you, you see a lot of variation in the algal assemblage. Think of Hopkins versus Stillwater, for example, really fundamentally different. Um, but otherwise, the large-scale pattern persists. There's these really strong differences in the fish, the invertebrates, and the algae um, as you move up and down the coast of California. Um, so what about metrics of, 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 of species richness and diversity? And how does that vary along that geographic gradient? So what I've plotted here <coughs> is the species richness, not diversity, species richness, just the number of species in each, at each one of these sites um, on average across each of these regions. So I'm going to show you several of these. This is the north central coast, the central coast, San Miguel Island, Santa Rosa Island, the south coast mainland, Santa Cruz Island, and Anacapa Island. Okay? And um, this is the taxonomic richness. So you see there's really high richness for invertebrates, um, and it, but it tends to be generally flat across those regions, whereas uh, the fish actually crank up from the north to the, to the islands, and then the, um, the algae tend to, to bounce up um, and back down again across this. This is that same pattern, but now it's just by latitude rather than regions. And again, what you see is a gradual increase in the invertebrate richness as you go from north to south. And it's the same sort of pattern for algae, but the fish really crank up in species richness as you go down towards Southern California. And you also see differences in where these uh, the richness peaks. So the fish peak uh, along the mainland of Southern California, whereas uh, the algae tend to peak out at Santa Rosa Island. Okay, so that was richness. Now we're going to look at diversity, right, that takes into account not just the number of species, but their relative abundances. And the same sort of uh, graphs again. And uh, what you see here is, um, is that invertebrates plummet as you go from north to south. And, and across these regions, where, and, and that's shown again here latitudinally as well. Whereas in sharp, and, and, and you tend to see a similar sort of pattern with the algae in yellow here, whereas you see a huge difference in, in, in the fish trend, right? Where, where diversity of the fish assemblage actually is going up as you go from north to south in contrast to the declining diversity that you see for the other two assemblages. Take home message is that, that just looking at the patterns of diversity of fish do not tell you anything about patterns of diversity of the other elements, the other assemblages in the community. Um, and you see differences in where they peak as well. So it, for the invertebrates, it was in Northern California, and, uh, North Central and Santa Rosa Island. For the fish, it was, as I mentioned, it was the mainland of Southern California. And for the algae, they peak in diversity way up north. 
Okay, and so that the point there, and that I want to make with this slide, is you got to be careful, because when you read the literature, people will describe diversity in either richness or diversity, right? Remember, richness is just the number of species, diversity is the number of species and their relative abundance. And oftentimes, they only show one, and they make all sorts of great conclusions about one of those metrics. But look here, where I've plotted in this matrix, if you compare the relationship between fish species richness and invertebrate species richness, they tend to be correlated with one another over space. Um, and uh, fish, fish diversity um, and uh, species, invertebrate species richness tend to show a similar pattern. But if you compare these two metrics of fish with invertebrate diversity rather than richness, you get an opposite trends. They're, they're actually showing completely opposite relationships depending on whether you're comparing richness or diversity. Especially, um, you can see a positive relationship between fish species richness and invertebrate species richness, and yet a negative relationship between fish diversity and invertebrate diversity. Right, so this has fundamental implications as to how you interpret um, the relationships of the diversity of these different groups. <clears throat> and the same thing happens when you compare, say, fish and the algal diversity and richness as well. Okay, so how do communities vary in space and are the patterns of variation consistent among the assemblages? All three of those assemblages exhibited really strong variation in taxonomic structure among the regions. Remember, north was different from central, which was different from southern. Um, and uh, uh, regionally and latitudinally. Um, and, but the, and those assemblages differ in the extent of variation that you see within a given region. So remember that um, the algae tended to mix among, it had a lot greater spatial variation within a region, especially Southern California, than did the fish or the invertebrates. So, so the patterns are not consistent among the different assemblages. And then the regional patterns of taxonomic diversity, rather than richness, differed among all three assemblages, right? So fish diversity cranked up uh, from north to south, whereas invertebrate and algal diversity tended to decrease along that same gradient, as well as the peak regions of diversity varied among the assemblages. So a real caveat of making inferences when you see patterns in one assemblage uh, to patterns of, of other, the other assemblages that constitute the communities. So what are the ecological and environmental uh, processes that explain this geographic pattern of community structure? And how does the relative importance of these processes, the environmental, various environmental variables and biotic interactions uh, vary among the species assemblages that constitute the communities? So the way we approach that is, um, is to look at the relative contribution of spatial patterns of, uh, different, of the different assemblages and the environmental variables to a response variable. So in this case, in this model, which is a multiple regression, we're asking <clears throat> how does the site-to-site -site differences in fish taxa, how well does that correlate with site-to-site -site differences in the algal taxa, and the invertebrate taxa, and a whole bunch of different physical environmental variables, right? So it allows us to ask, what is the relative contribution of each of those to explaining the spatial, spatial variation, in, in this case, in the fish assemblage? And we can do that and tease out the importance of the biological as well as the environmental variables. Um, and so now I'm going to blast through how we generated these spatial patterns of some of the, of the environmental and some biological variables. So sea surface temperature obviously is a potential uh, strong correlate with community structure. And so we look at sea surface temperature patterns up and down the coast. We look at the values offshore and inshore and we take the difference of those as a proxy for the magnitude of coastal upwelling up and down the coast. Um, for ocean productivity, we use chlorophyll concentrations um, near shore. Uh, and then <clears throat> we use a wave exposure model that USGS developed 
that has amazing, um, it, not temporal, but just spatial patterns um, with amazing spatial resolution, 30 to 50 meters along the shore, um, uh, or 60 to 100 meters along shore. So it nicely matches the spatial scale of the, of the ecological surveys that we're doing. Um, and then we use that to look at, at um, uh, wave force and whether, whether variation in community structure corresponds with exposure to, to waves along the coast. And then, because California is really unique, probably unique relative to anywhere in the world at this point, certainly anywhere in the United States, with an amazing seafloor map, high resolution seafloor map, which is an amazing opportunity for us ecologists to ask questions about how does the shape of the seafloor influence or correlate at least with patterns of uh, community structure. So, and there's a boatload of these and I'm just gonna go through them. You'll see examples of the images over here. This is, this is uh, variation in depth, uh, variation in slope, um, and these are just contrasting sites to give you an example. There's slope of slopes across the reef. There's the, what they call the vector ruggedness measure. These are all different metrics of describing the rugosity of the reef. <clears throat> the benthic position index is another one. Um, and then the depth range of the kelp forest. Um, and then the variation in depth along, uh, throughout the kelp forest. And then we calculate the average of these different metrics as well as their standard deviation, the variation in that metric for every one of the sites. Um, and that allows us to compare communities with the, the seafloor features. For the biotic variables, there were three or four that we wanted to pull out separately from all other biotic variables. One is harbor seal density. Um, and uh, and <coughs> that was... Uh, uh, data that were provided to us by Mark Lowry down at NOAA NIMS. Um, and these are his maps that we, we digitized. Um, and the red is higher, higher densities of harbor seals um, versus the green, which are lower densities, and how those are distributed in the north, the central, and the south coast. Um, and then, having made those maps of the distribution, interpolating these maps of, of density distributions, we superimpose them on every one of our sites to be able to put a value of harbor seal density associated with each site. We do the same thing for sea otters, sea otter density, um, based on uh, estimates generated by Tim Tinker's group. Uh, we do the same thing for giant kelp, Notice there's not much giant kelp in North Central California. Uh, lots of it in Central and South Coast. We do it for bull kelp. There's no bull kelp down in Southern Coast, but there is in the North and the Central. Uh, and then, hang on, don't just chill, okay? Uh, and then what you do is you put this in those multiple regression models, right? And it tells you how much of all of that monkey business you can explain the spatial variation in the structure of these assemblages. So, for example, the regression model that we came up with explains about 63% of the spatial variation in the fish assemblage up and down the coast. Um, and then these variables show the, the, the amount of that variation, relative uh, variation that's explained by each of these. So here's a take home message. Uh, so of all, and I've tried to scale these with the arrows, so when it comes to explaining spatial variation in the fish assemblage along the coast, physical, baby, physical environment, sea surface temperature, reef depth, mean annual waves, right? Those are all things that are really influencing the spatial pattern of the structure of the fish assemblage. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, there's some contribution from the invertebrate assemblage um, not much from our otters and, and the kelp canopies. <clears throat> then when we look at the invertebrates, again, there's about 62% of their spatial variation. The big winner, again, is the physical environment, right? That's explaining the majority of spatial variation that you see. Um, uh, and then second to that is our furry little friends, the uh, sea otters, um, <clears throat> probably as predators in the system and structuring the system. Um, and, and then some contribution from the benthic algae. 
Um, and then when it comes to the algae, again, the big driver, or the big correlate, I should say, is the physical environment. And, and I've listed each of the different kinds of uh, environmental variables that are explaining that variation. And then, and then also, now you see otters and the canopy forming algae that are competing for light with light, changing light availability are also having a bigger influence on the algae. So to summarize these patterns, um, <clears throat> what I've done is shown for the north central, the central coast, the south coast, and out in those channel islands, um, the contribution, the variance explained, spatial variation explained, by all of these different variables down here. These are seals, fish, otters, inverts, algae, canopy forming nereocystis and macrocystis, and the physical variables. Um, and, and I've done that for the fish, the invertebrates, and the algae. And I've color coded the, the biotic variables as to whether they're top down or bottom up, right? Whether they're probably predators on some of these guys, higher level species, or, uh, or algae and invertebrates. So for the fish, as I, as I just mentioned, for the fish, the inverts, and the algae, the tallest bars are always the physical environment, okay? Sorry, I'm a community ecologist. I dug, dig species interactions, but man, the environment tells the story, right? Unfortunately, for the islands, um, <coughs> uh, we don't have good seafloor maps, and we don't have the swell models. So, um, there, so these, are, these values are low. In reality, I'm sure they're much higher than that, right? And then for the fish, um, the other factors that contribute to explaining their spatial variation are these bottom-up features or factors, um, like whether, how much canopy there is um, and, uh, and the algal taxa and invert taxa um, down here, algal taxa and canopy. Um, but one thing to notice, most importantly, and this is what I want to impress you upon, is um, that they're not consistent in space, right? The factors that are contributing to the spatial variation for fishes are uh, our physical environment up and down the coast, but then you get different factors contributing, and those are different from what you see for the invertebrates, and those are different for what you see for the algae. And generally speaking, you see that fish are most influenced by bottom up, Right, the kinds of algae and invertebrates in the system. The invertebrates are a mix of bottom up and top down, and then the algae are largely top down um, biotic drivers. But again, only all of that is second to the physical environment. Um, and then when you look at the contribution of the different kinds of environmental variables, you see that they vary markedly as well. So once again, here's the fishes, the invertebrates, and the algae. Um, and the pie shows the relative contribution of each of these different environmental variables in explaining the spatial variation. So this pie is the contribution of these variables to explaining the fish spatial variation in the fish assemblage in North Central California. First thing you see, none of them are the same, for the most part, right? Each of the different assemblages in each of the different regions are being, influ are are being influenced by different environmental variables. Wouldn't life be cool if they were all being driven by the same thing, everyone in every place? Not even close, right? There are a couple of exceptions where you see that in Central California, both the algae and the fishes a lot of that, their spatial variation corresponds with spatial variation in upwelling. <clears throat> and then likewise in Southern California, oops, in Southern California, um, uh, the, the fish and the invertebrates again tend, to, their assemblages are correlate with the amount of bare substrate, which may be sand scour and physical disturbance. Um, but otherwise you see a lot of variation and what factors are contributing to the spatial patterns of community of assemblage structure up and down the coast. 
So environmental variables had the greatest contribution to explaining all three assemblages in all four regions. Um, but the identity of, the, of each of those environmental variables, whether it was upwelling or bare substrate or some other factor, tended to vary greatly among the different regions and among the different assemblages. Um, the fish assemblage was largely uh, uh, explained by variation in bottom-up factors. The invertebrates by a combination of top-down and bottom-up, and the algal assemblage by uh, largely top-down. So again, um, you know, the factors that are contributing to the spatial patterns of each of those assemblages differ um, regionally and among the assemblages. So <clears throat> now let's get to this question about the tax, the how can uh, the, the patterns of taxonomic and functional structure and diversity and whether you see spatial concordance in, uh, in taxonomic metrics with functional metrics. In other words, if we go out and look at the taxonomic diversity, can we make inferences about functional diversity in these different groups and how does that vary? So to do that, um, <clears throat> what I've plotted again is uh, in each of the regions, these three are the north central, these are the central, and these are the islands, the south coast and islands. Um, <clears throat> and this column shows how fish taxonomic structure varies across the three regions, right? This shows, and then what I did is I selected the two most um, correlated functional traits for fish. That was their trophic group, right? Whether they were herbivores, planktivores, piscivores, and growth form, uh, which for, for fish is, you know, whether they were uh, more flattened, more elongated, that kind of thing. Um, which coral and, and what you see, these row values that scale to one, the row values describe the relationship between this functional trait and taxonomic structure across the whole coastline, and it's really high. So in general, patterns of taxonomic structure can uh, describe geographic patterns of some of these functional traits up and down the coast. Um, <clears throat> but, but, the, but how well those match also tend to vary between the regions. So it's not, look at, look at the difference between this and that and that, right? So it's not very good match for the most part between those functional traits and the taxonomic pattern in the north central. It's actually really good in central California, and then it goes to hell again down in southern California, right? Um, <clears throat> and you tend to see a similar pattern. In this case, we're looking at trophic group again of the invertebrates versus the taxonomic structure, and now feeding mode, right? Whether they're suspension feeders or, um, or passive feeders. And, and a similar pattern. So in this case, invert the trophic group and the taxonomic structure are pretty good, but not so good between feeding mode and taxonomic structure, but actually quite good again in the central coast, and then it goes to hell again in Southern California. Um, and we see the same general pattern for the algae as well. This is al algal taxonomic structure of the communities up and down the coast. This is the algal thermal affinity um, and the growth form of the algae, right? Whether they're canopy or subcanopy. And again, overall, pretty high concordance up and down the coast between these functional traits and the taxonomic structure of the, of the algal assemblage. Um, but it is not very good in the north. It's again, quite good in central California and then not very good um, down in Southern California again. Okay, so again, what that suggests is that for some functional traits, taxonomic patterns are nice proxies for making inferences about these functional groups in the system, but it differs, it varies regionally as to how well you can, you see relationships between taxonomic and functional um, structure. Okay, so what about diversity itself? Um, and this is again looking, I showed you this before, these is the regional comparisons, this is the latitudinal comparison. Um, and what you tend to see here, 
is that, and plotted at the top is taxonomic diversity. Then this is that trophic diversity and the growth form diversity and thermal affinity diversity, right? So we're looking at the, the, the diversity of each of these functional traits across the region with and asking how well does that compare with taxonomic diversity? How well can we use taxonomic diversity as proxies? Um, and what you see is that it's actually pretty good with respect to um, thermal affinity and um, taxonomic diversity, suggesting that the patterns of thermal affinity of fishes up and down the coast corresponds quite well with the taxonomic diversity of fishes in these kelp forests up and down the coast. <clears throat> when we look at, um, and so that's making that point, when we look at invertebrates, um, similarly, you see that uh, these two functional traits, trophic diversity and, and feeding mode diversity, show track quite similarly um, taxonomic diversity, suggesting a pretty reasonable proxy. But uh, thermal affinity, in this case, con contrary to the fishes, goes the opposite direction as thermal diversity, suggesting that thermal affinity of the invertebrates is not helping to explain patterns of, of, of invertebrate taxonomic diversity along the coast. And then these are the al same patterns for the algae. And in this case, it's, they actually um, are pretty cool. They, they correspond really quite well in space, both regionally and latitudinally. So this is, again, the taxonomic diversity of the algae up across the regions. And you can see that um, the growth form, the diversity of growth forms and the diversity of, the, of thermal affinity um, tends to, uh, tends, especially across regions, tends to track well with the taxonomic diversity. Again, suggesting that diversity is a reasonable proxy or gives you some insight for the variation in these, these functional traits in the system. So to summarize this, the concordance of the taxonomic structure and the functional structure was high up and down the whole coast, which is cool. Right? I mean, we can, you can use taxonomic patterns um, and see and, and get some insight from, uh, with respect to the functional structure of these assemblages. Um, but, but it varied among the assemblages. It was highest for the inverts, then the fish, and lowest for the algae. Um, and then the concordance in the structure also varies among the functional traits, right? So, so remember, trophic group and thermal affinity tend to oftentimes be well correspond correlated with taxonomic diversity, but some of the others were not as clean. <clears throat> and those were the only ones that be, were significant. Um, and then the concordance of taxonomic diversity and functional diversity, rather than structure, now we're talking about diversity, also varied greatly among the assemblages and their functional traits. So, so the, relation, the spatial relationship between taxonomic diversity and functional diversity was highest for the algae, then the fish, and lowest for the invertebrates. Um, and then the factors, the traits that corresponded varied. So for algae, it was growth form, um, which, and, and, and very poor for thermal affinity, where, which was the opposite for the fish, where it was thermal affinity that corresponded most with the patterns of fish assemblages. Um, and then the feeding mode uh, was the highest for the invertebrates. So you see differences in different functional traits um, corresponding with these patterns of taxonomic diversity. So in conclusion, um, the assemblages that constitute the kelp forest communities show this really strong, predictable geographic range, ge geographic pattern in both taxonomic structure, taxonomic richness, and diversity. Um, but these metrics show very different geographic patterns both uh, uh, within the assemblages. Um, so for example, remember how fish, fish richness went up um, as you went south where, uh, uh, sorry, fish richness went down as you went south, but fish diversity went up, right? So, so the point being that these different metrics that ecologists use to describe the state of these different assemblages are showing completely different patterns relative to one another. 
and, and, and one of the most important uh, interpretations or inferences of that is that you got to be really careful when you think that any one of these metrics is an accurate characterization um, and, and, uh, and, ref and is concordant with some of these other metrics like diversity and richness. Um, the regional patterns of variation in taxonomic structure are consistent again ac uh, across the three assemblages, but the assemblages differed in the extent of variation within regions. So this again was nice that you saw, remember, really distinct and similar differences up and down the coast for the fish, the invertebrates, and the algae, but within a given region, like especially Southern California, the degree of spatial variation of each of those assemblages was really different from one another. Um, and then remember the environmental variables that uh, had the greatest contribution to explaining um, uh, that it was, excuse me, it was environmental variables that had the greatest contribution to explaining the spatial patterning that we see. The environment has a huge influence on who lives where, right? <clears throat> but the identity of each of the different environmental variables varied between the assemblages as well as between the regions. It means that if you see that upwelling is really important in Central California, don't pretend to tell me that it's also important in Southern California and Northern California, right? Or um, uh, if not upwelling, rugosity of the reef or swell exposure, right? And, <clears throat> and then in, likewise, the assemblages differed in the extent to which, the, that, that by that I mean the fish, the invertebrates, the algae, really differed in the extent to which it was top-down biotic factors versus bottom-up. Um, biotic factors that explain the spatial patterns in those assemblages as well. So, um, uh, so we saw this geographic concordance in taxonomic and functional diversity um, uh, for all three assemblages, which is cool, um, but it differs among the functional groups and their traits. So even though you see some concordance in the taxonomic patterns, you don't necessarily see similar patterns in the different functional groups of each of those assemblages. And all of these patterns suggest uh, caution in making inferences or generalizations of patterns and the causes of those patterns among the different assemblages. I, like I said, you know, thermal affinity tends to correlate really well with patterns of fish diversity. But it, was, it sure as hell didn't when it came to the algae, right? So the factors that are driving these spatial patterns of these assemblages differ markedly uh, between those. And when you read a paper that shows, talks about the patterns of hot spots of diversity of fish assemblages along the co along the, in the Pacific Ocean, that doesn't tell you jack about any of the other assemblages that constitute those communities necessarily. Um, but, and then the point is that all of this suggests that by doing these surveys over these broad geographic scales, that's when you can actually start to understand these patterns and learn more about how well um, both the, the, di the different assemblages co-vary with one another and the importance of those environmental variables that explain the variation that we see. So. Um, I'm a real fan of large-scale, long-term <clears throat> studies that get at really characterizing accurately these patterns of community structure, which in turn allow us to really nail down what are the factors in the environment and the interactions among species that are responsible for structuring communities, natural communities. And Quickly, these are my buddies that helped collect all this stuff, uh, money from all these folks, um, a bunch of, a boatload of scuba divers um, that all survived, okay? We didn't lose anybody over that. Um, these are my, my friends up at um, uh, Santa Cruz that helped with the analyses and management of the program. And then these are my buddies on the farm, <laughs> Brownie and Whitey. Right, that Mary Margaret takes care of most, mostly. Okay, uh, thanks very much for your time.
yeah. It is. He's done a lot of gymnastics to try to understand the patterns. But one phenomenon, or one community trait that you haven't measured or talked about is the dominant species. Uh huh. Of any of those three systems, the fishes, the algae, and the invertebrates, and how important they would be. And my yeah. way of thinking about this is if you go up to the Aleutian Islands where there are infamous papers about sea otters, uh huh. Where would they fit in? And yeah. Why aren't the otters so influential down here? Yeah. It, so. The dominant species? Yeah. So that's why we that's why we actually pulled out some of those particular species like Nereocystis and Macrocystis. We actually you know evaluated separately because I think they're the dominant of the macroalgal assemblage, right? Um, and in, at times they contributed, you know, they explained some of that variation, even for the fish. You saw that there was a relationship between spatial variation in the fish assemblage and, um, and the canopy forming species, especially Nereo um, and, and Macro. Um, and, uh, and then, so those are the dominant algal species for the most part. And then otters did contribute even I think to the fish, um, variation in the fish assemblage, but only in central California because that's the only place that they're hanging out, right? Um, yeah. I, was also I, I thought. To the concept of dominance. There's an inverse relationship between the dominance and an assemblage and its diversity in richness. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, right, right. No, it'd be good, like you're suggesting, it'd be good to look at some of those species that are proportional, disproportionately abundant and yeah. how much they're, yeah. Jim. So I was impressed by the explanatory capability of the multiple regression. You know, mm -hmm. Right. If you were, what other things didn't you um, throw in the model? Yeah. What, yeah. what can't you collect or could you, or would you collect if you were to go back out and do this again? Uh huh. To get, to capture more of that 40% that was unexplained. Yeah. What those environmental factors do you think are missing? Yeah, I don't know. Um, because obviously we went after the ones that we thought would be most influential. Um, you know, the, the structure of the reef. Um, and attributes of the water column, you know, chlorophyll, um, water temperature, et cetera, swell exposure. So I don't know what other, I mean, it'd be great to hear if anybody else has ideas. I think instead um, that a lot of that variability might just be, um, you know, mess, just, uh, you know, across the different sites. And, and the, and, and the fact, by the fact that you're sampling right at the shoreline in a kelp forest, and some of those environmental yeah. factors, like chlorophyll, in fact, are being measured far enough. Well, far and especially the hardest one is coastal upwelling, yeah. right? I mean, you yeah. know that the intensity or the manifestation of that varies as a function of the form of the reef and, you know, the, the, the slope of the seafloor. Um, so that's the one that I am most suspect of is how well are upwelling. But, but it actually fell out as one of the, as, as good or bad uh, of, a, of a metric that we used, it actually did contribute to explaining variation in both the fish and the algal um, assemblages along the coast. Mike. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Right, and so, so both of those would contribute to the overall effect. And actually, I didn't have time to point out um, that <clears throat> it's very interesting, both the algal, I think, but definitely the fish assemblages um, at Terrace, Terrace Point up on the north part of Monterey Bay and down at Point Conception are more similar to one another than any of the sites in between. 
And it's exactly that. They're both sandstone, uh, friable reefs with lots of turbidity um, that, I, that was influencing both uh, the patterns of the algal assemblage as well as the fish assemblage. And, it might, and, and we've thrown that in, uh, but I don't think it was in this analysis be, using the, the, geogra the geology maps of the different basaltic um, and sandstone uh, reef structure, um, and, and that's actually big. So it, it reinforces the importance of the environmental uh, variables. You primed us early in this with this map of your study sites and your rationale for looking at it from the north coast all the way down to San Diego. Mm -hmm. And in those maps were fish and non fish areas. You yeah. Talked about the yeah. And, and it's, you know, why is because this is the baseline characterization in 2010 and 2011. Um, and so it was so recent after they had, and I'm trying to remember whether we threw MPAs in as a variable. And, the, but I, and I don't think they're in here and in, in largely simply because, um, because those MPAs are so new that I can't imagine that they contribute to any of the spatial patterns. The data in the model, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the question right. would be whether or not fishing Yeah. Based on targeting or anything else yeah. related to kind of what's great. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I think that the, the MPAs are so recent that, that those effects would yet, have yet to be manifest. <laughs> what a great way to set up a question. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. Well, you know the. Yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect segue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, you bet. Well, uh, it's bigger than a bone. I mean, OPC sat fellow. Um, the issue here is that those data simply aren't collected. And so if you're going to set up a large-scale long-term monitoring program to both evaluate the state of these, you know, the, the, the consequence of these marine protected areas, um, as well as how climate change is manifest. And, and if we're seeing this kind of variation already, you can imagine that the manifestation of climate is going to vary regionally as well. But we're not measuring that stuff. And so if you're going to set up this kind of program, this is what I'm jumping up and down about, is, is start getting instruments in the water that will allow us to actually start throwing those variables into these, to these relationships. And, and otherwise, we can't do it. So, uh, so it, and there, there again, I think it's probably an issue of cost, right? I mean, we've got to make reasonably priced instruments that we could populate, not every one of these places, right? But at least several of them across that broad geographic range again. Yeah. I was going to take the alternate because I was going, where were the microbes? And yeah, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But what the bottom line is, you explained what you wanted to explain Uh -huh. And you explained right. everything you wanted to explain in a way that you thought was more organized than haphazard. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Pattern pattern was revealed <coughs> among those things that we were able to look at. Um, but you know, if we can get more sophisticated and and start doing the DNA um, monitoring as well to get at microbial but communities. I, I tried to. I, I saw, for instance, chlorophyll appear in three three of these slices. Yeah. Of the pie, and uh huh. I was yeah, yeah. And I thought that the thought of you that if you're doing temperature and upwelling, chlorophyll will certainly come in and out uh, right. like, uh, as a major feature, but I didn't see it there at all. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. You organize what your eye can see perfectly. Uh huh. Yeah.
Um, no, the, it was the same sampling regime, yeah, so sam methods, you, protocols. Okay, yeah, so yeah. Question. You had algal diversity, but normally you don't employ samples. Well, but, so, but so that, that's a very important point, though. So my measure of diversity is the relative abundance of, say, the, those categories of red foliose algae. So if you it, have any it, so yeah, right? So it is interesting, and, and that's why I thought Michael would jump all over me on this one. But because if you actually look at the, the folios red algal diversity, taxonomic diversity at that taxonomic level, um, I don't know whether it would influence these patterns or not. Uh, and then there the problem is, good luck finding somebody who can uh, distinguish all the different damn red algae in a kelp bed. Right? Hell, it would take us years to train people to go out and do this. That's why we throw them into those, those morphological categories. Yeah, but, but, sorry, but, but that's what would be neat. And I don't think anybody's done it where uh, to go to these different places, bring in the ringers, look at the patterns of actual algal diver taxonomic diversity and those categorical diverse, the diversity of those categories and see how well they correspond with can, can we use that as a reasonable proxy for that higher resolution? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a combination of them, right? But uh, swell exposure is really big. Um, physical, right? Physical uh, force is a really big variable, and then the rugosity is another, and slope of the reef. Yeah. Well, I yeah. Just want to comment on that because yeah. this all started back when Foster and you were out doing this descriptively and just started to become quantitative. Mm -hmm. Going to all the reefs you could possibly go to, you kind of figured that out then, and then people down south figured that out as well. That physical structure is really important, and then yeah. only a single paper has come out in the last fifty years. I know. In science, it's yeah. anything different. And then when that paper yeah. came out, five more came out to disprove it to say it's all physics. It's all physics. Uh -huh. At what point do you just stop and realize that, regardless of how much money you throw at it, physics will ultimately just come out of the driver. Is a, is a primary driver. Ask another question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, and it's interesting because. But, but then the question is, uh, once it, within regions of similar physics, then what are the biotic factors that are coming into play, which is that top down and bottom up as well? Like there's so much effort to still try to disprove yeah. Halperin's, Halperin's the, data the e and the impact of that one paper, uh -huh. that now you've got so much data, you yeah. hope that with this data set, you can probably yeah. move on and ask some more detailed questions like this. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right, yeah. So uh, you found all this variation in the drivers, even among uh, the physical factors, different regions and different physical factors were yeah. important. Do you yep. think that there's any underlying rules or processes that are guiding which things are important, or do you think it's totally, you know, it's evolutionary history, it's all random, it can't be predicted, or do you, do you think there is some yeah. underlying order behind all this variability and messiness? Yeah, but but <clears throat> but it's spatially determined. I think that's the big part, right? So, so yes, there are different environmental variables that contribute importantly to the community structure, um, but they're consistent geographically. Um, so at least we know that if you go to north central California, the environmental variables that are shaping those assemblages are, are what they are, and they are different from southern and central and southern California. So that's the that's sort of the take home to me, um, and I and you know I think once you then dig into e within each one of those regions, and especially looking at the with the variation among sites within a region, then you start to better understand why those variables are as as important as they are. Yeah. Uh huh. 
Right. Yeah. Good question. Um, and I, you know, an oceanographer might better um, explain that. But, but the nice thing, at least uh, in the shallow waters that we're working in, it's probably a reasonable proxy for, for the large scale patterns that we're seeing. We we don't see um, small. We or we. I don't think we're detecting, especially using that sea surface temperature, the remote sensing data. We don't see small scale variation in sea surface temperature. It's driving those really large scale patterns, um, which I think probably are consistent through the water column. I mean, it's a whole lot warmer in Catalina than it is here, and it's butt cold up north. <laughs> I don't, whether you're at the surface or on the, at 20 meters. Do you love, love a beer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hey, thanks very much. <laughs>